See an a-hole in it? Oh, all right. Welcome, everyone. This is our Friday Live. This is where we go over uh, uh, saxophones and all sorts of good stuff this month of Saxtember. Uh, this week, we released our Wilmington Pro Bass Saxophone, and we are super proud to share that with you today. Oh, yeah. We've got special guests, Kurt Alterac, who's the owner of MusicMedic.com. We also have Benny Hill, uh, who's our professional saxophonist extraordinaire, who's going to come in and demonstrate the bass for you. This is his first time. Uh, playing bass saxophone. He's going to use the stock mouthpiece and reed that comes with the bass, and that's going to be super exciting to hear. Uh, we're also going to talk about the Alterac vent, which makes this bass saxophone completely unique. It is the only bass saxophone in the world that plays the D2. Uh, that's the D with the octave key. Um, so this is kind of our you know, a culmination of many years of work that we've done here together, and we're going to be talking with Kurt on kind of the inception of all that. We're also going to announce our winner for the Wednesday Wisdom Giveaway. Um, those of you who use the hashtag Saxtember in the comments, we've taken your names and we've got a winner we're going to announce right before Benny plays. Uh, so if you're watching this video live, whether you watch it now or between now and next Friday, Take the hashtag Saxtember, at Saxtember, put it in the comments below, and you'll be entered in uh, to win a set of custom key risers. Uh, so, Kurt, let me just see what I got for you here, sir. Um, tell me about, well, we want to talk about the Alterac vent, but let, tell me the story of like how we got to <coughs> this point. Okay. Like, so how did we get started with um, the Sax Pro Shop? deciding to 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 come out with a bass okay yeah hey rich and hey everybody so so about eight years ago the sax pro shop we were we were interested in doing projects and we one of the projects that we we, we took on was to get and and improve a bass saxophone so we searched around and we found two bass saxophones that were being produced um, that we could get and then do whatever we wanted to so we bought these two bass saxophones one, is a, one was a, a, a copy of sort of an old busher, and one was sort of a copy of a Selmer. And since the sky was the limit, we sort of started out on the busher, and we started to modify the heck out of that thing. And originally, we had thought that we were going to make whole parts of it, like the whole down pipe here. And we would have needed to. We took that off. We had to retaper it. We had to move a lot of tone holes. Um, both instruments had a lot of uh, uh, mechanical issues, but that one had a lot more tonal issues, and, uh, and, and we set about to fix them. We did eventually get something that we were pretty happy with, but it took too much work, and we didn't feel that it would be a viable thing that people would get it, that it would be worth it for people to, to sort of pay us to do all that work. So, so right. we settled on this shorter wrap um, instrument that, that, that right out of the box played better and was great. So we, we switched over to that one and we, we started working on that. And when we realized that this instrument was a really good candidate for to be the canvas of, of the Wilmington bass saxophone in the future, we, we went and bought, I bought three more of them. So now I had four of them in house and we started to just modify the heck out of them. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to take away, like we do in our overhauls, like we do with everything, with every instrument that we're working on, we're trying to make the instrument uh, more comfortable for the player and just take away any distance between the player and the instrument. So hmm. sometimes that distance can come in the way it feels or it can come in how stable it is. If every time you pick it up, it's not playing well, it's not stable, then you, you don't trust your instrument. Um, it could be in the tone or it could be in the intonation. If the intonation is bad and you're always having to adjust, then you're 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 making the instrument play and you're not just having a good time playing it so so we set about fixing those things and we did things like uh, well first off the instrument was B flat to high F sharp so that was really important because a lot of the vintage basses only go up to E flat hmm. and um, that's what I was struggling with with my bass at the time is that it only went to E flat um, so I'm happy to have the full range so someone can pick this up who's never played like Benny's gonna do today and just play it with the normal fingerings and all the way up to high F sharp so that's cool um, as far as walking away from the instrument and coming back to it and having it play the same way that it did when you left it uh, that requires some mechanical things uh, that requires some bracing and some stability that might not be there on a normal instrument so what we did is this top part here there's a lot going on on this between these two pipes. There's two pipes here that 
One goes up and one comes down, and there's all kinds of mechanisms between them and pads on them. And this is a place where damage would and could and does happen. So we double braced it. So you have two braces on here that are both really rigid. And if you were to try to wiggle this around, you'll see that this is solid. You could probably pick this instrument up from almost anywhere on this top mm. joint, and it, and, and it will be solid. And when you put it down and play it, it'll feel exactly the same. And then on the bottom section of the instrument, we also wanted to make sure that it was braced. So here you have a brace. There's a brace in here, um, like an M brace. And then over here, there's a brace that's shaped like a V. And what these two braces do is they sturdy up the, the bell to body connection. So when, these two, when this connection is not solid, right now I can wiggle this around and this is all one unit. It's not going anywhere. So when this is solid, these tone holes, when this, when, it, when this instrument takes a fall or even a small bump in the case, these tone holes aren't going to get distorted. This is all going to stay exactly the same. So, so basically from, from the entire bottom of the instrument and then the entire top of the instrument, we braced it up real well to make sure that it would just always be exactly the same when you came back and played it. Another problem that happens that, that where the instrument changes when you play it is on the on the key touches. Uh, you, the, the, on the bass, the pad can be really far away from where your finger is because of the size of the instrument. So it requires a long rod and then a lever to get under your finger. Hmm. Those levers traditionally are floating around in space. So when you push them, you don't really feel a solid end to that. What we did on the Wilmington bass is every single key touch has a foot underneath that touches the body. So no matter how hard you push, you are not going to bend these keys. But in my opinion, just as importantly, when you push, you feel a certain solidness that, that gives you a confidence about the instrument. Like you don't feel like you could bend it. And bass is an instrument that you have to hold up by the neck strap sometimes. And sometimes you put too much pressure on the key work. And this bass can easily take that. It's really built like a tank. And then the bottom stack is the same way. All the, all the touches that, that can have... Um, that can have a contact habit, and the side keys also all have contacts on them. So, so every key that you touch has a contact underneath it. Um, another problem that we saw is like lost motion. So we put adjustment screws wherever we could to take up lost motion. An important one was the front F, where those can be adjusted to open up the F key and we can get the note in to sound right, but then you always end up with some, or you can end up with some lost motion. Mm -hmm. This front F has an adjustment screw on it that keeps the lost motion from being in the front F. So you can set it up so that your F opens as high as you want, and then you can turn the adjustment screw and the slider, and you can take all the lost motion out of that key. So the whole thing is like, a, the, the idea is that, that when, you, when you walk away from this instrument, you come back to play it, it's gonna be exactly the same as it was when you, when you left it. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is that the long rods are also all solid nickel. Hmm. And that, that is because, you know, these rods can be, this rod here is running from down here up to here. So we're about that long on one rod on a base. That's probably longer than an alto is. And so they can flex. You can get a lot of flex in that. And these rods are nickel, so they flex less. And if they do, uh, um, they're less likely to flex. They're less likely to bend and then be, be in a bent position. So that's kind of how we came about the base. And, and at that time, we had, uh, now we had four bases. We got one of them working, it was our prototype. We sent some of the bells out to different engravers because we wanted them to be beautiful and we wanted to test out some engravers and we were all really hot on this project. And then as we got playing the prototype, that sort of the, the elephant in the room kept coming up, this, mm -hmm. this, this D, this D and D sharp, these notes that just don't speak on a bass. I mean, they just don't work. And so on my bass, I'll play I used to, I, I have this mechanism now, but I would play two and three and one, two and three, and then add my palm D, or maybe I would just play palm D and E flat. Um, but what that does is that when you pick it up, you know you're playing a bass. And before you even give someone a bass, you have to say, here's how you play D on this bass, and this is what you do. And then the person, when they play it, it takes weeks and they get used to it, um, hopefully, but, but it's always gonna be a space between you and the instrument. You can't play it like your other saxophones. So then that brought about, let's fix that problem. Let's try okay. to solve that problem. And, uh, and that was really a tough one to go about. So is that, so we've, you've talked about a bunch of, uh, getting kind of a baseline of, of 
or a foundation to work from. And now those have become features, but now you have this additional problem. And is this where the Alterac vent starts to be developed? Yes. Yeah, thanks, Rich. And so those did become features, but there's also, there's a bunch, so there's a bunch of other features as well, right? That, right. that don't kind of lend themselves to, um, that aren't designed just for that purpose of bringing the instrument closer to the player. And we could talk about those at another time, but, um, but yeah, then, then, then we wanted to, we wanted to get that D to, to work and to function and, and it, and it wouldn't, you pushed your D key and, and your, you, you play D and you push your octave key and it, and it just doesn't speak. And any bass player that's here is watching, that's of course what they're dealing with every day. Um, so we started to cut holes in this bass, our prototype, and we started to put octave vents on and, um, uh, and for that, I, I had I have that original one. So this is the this is the original uh, down pipe there, whatever this last piece of pipe is called um, for the bass. And you can see that we 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 went about with we went about putting our octave vents in there where we could and building mechanisms to reach to these vents and trying to kind of trying to find the right location to fix that D, but also to fix other problems. And what we what we did is we had a ton of success. We 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 had the, a triple octave vent work, and then we built. Uh, then we went on and we wanted to fix some other issues, and we were moving vents around. So we built a four octave system. So that means four octave keys. So you you push one button, and any of four octave vents would open up, and it was hmm. really crazy to see it. It worked for about a day, and then it okay. and then it broke. Yeah, it was really cumbersome and difficult. Um, we made, I don't know, maybe we made four iterations of that thing. We spent a whole lot of time, a lot of drawings. We ended up sending it to a local um, machine shop to give us a full mechanical drawing of it so we mm. could duplicate it. It was really a difficult and, and timely project. And then we, we, we got into other projects and we just sort of put these bases into the closet. So, mm. so now to answer your question, Rich, if we can just jump forward like eight years to about a year ago, mm. um, we had some changes in the pro shop and uh, Jeff Mass is in there and he's, he's doing some great work and, and, and we had time and, and Jeff's the kind of guy that we, that I thought could make this octave vent and, and make the triple octave vent work. And then my part of the job is to know where to put the holes and, and, hmm. and, 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 and that sort of part of it. So, so we worked together on it and Jeff made the this what what is a triple octave vent now. So we went down from four and we went to a more understandable and repairable three octave vents. But the old four vent used to have five holes because okay. one one vent was two holes. This three vent has four holes. So it has a it has what what you might call the neck vent on a normal saxophone, and then. This is a normal saxophone, <laughs> but what what you might call the neck vent when it's on the neck, and then you have the body vent. Why can't I find it? Then you have the body vent here, and this one has two vents right here for the D, and we also added this guard, so it Sweet. has these two vents and and that. And so we ended up the two vents. We tried one vent. We tried different locations. Um, with the two vents and the right diameter, we we found we found a location and vent lo and vent size and location that work so well that it's almost scary. They almost work better than the notes around them because they have dedicated vents just for that, right? So suddenly, with this system, we're able to just pick up the instrument and start playing it, and you don't have to know anything about special about the bass. The bass is unique, and it's hard to just pick it up and play it. But true. But you don't have to know any alternate fingerings with this bass, and that was one of our big goals, right? So I think we've I think we've arrived there now with the Wilmington bass, and then the Alterag vent mechanism. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. So between your acoustical knowledge and uh, Jeff and and everybody else who works in the Sax Pro Shop, uh, mechanical and fabrication knowledge and skill. The combination of, of all of you were able to come up with, with this. Yeah, so I really don't think any one of us could have done it alone. I think we all needed each other, and, it, and, it, and we just, and, and through the years of, of having that work previously and now, it, it really came together well. And now it, it functions beautifully. I can, if, if I can show you, um, 
you can see them work. I imagine when I first saw this, I always imagine it's like when they first saw the, the, the old, you know, in, in, 19, in the early 1900s, there were two octave vents. There were two buttons here and, and a right. player would have to push for the neck and then over here for the body. And then they made this automatic mechanism. People must have been amazed, right? Yeah. So this, this, to me, this is that same. Here you can see if I go from G to A, you can see these two working. Mm -hmm. And if I go from, let's say, D, D to, let's see, D to what? Um, here's D to E. And you can see these two vents opening and closing, D to A. So you can see this vent up here open, and then this vent down here. So the player doesn't have to know anything, and the vents just not anything. But the player doesn't have to know about the mechanism, and the vents automatically open, no no alternate fingerings. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Let's well let's bring Benny on. Let, Benny, come on up, and and while well, Benny's getting set up, because this is Benny's first time playing a uh, bass saxophone. Benny, of course, is a professional saxophonist. He's a professor of music at Cape Fear Community College here in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, he's also a client of the Sax Pro Shop for couple years a uh, couple ten years <laughs> yeah. and uh so benny's gonna play the bass for you while he's getting set up um i we have an article so if if any part of uh kurt's explanation excites you and you want to learn more about it um, go to musicmedic.com and sign up for our newsletter it's at the bottom of the home page and uh at the very end of the month we'll put out our bench notes newsletter and it's going to have uh, basically kind of a technical explanation of, of what Kurt has described for you. Uh, so if you're a technician, you want to kind of learn more about how the function of the instrument works, or if you're a player and you want to kind of wrap your head around it more, uh, that's how you're going to be able to find out more about that. Um, I want to do, before Benny plays, I also want to give uh, the the giveaway. We do, Ryan and I, on Wednesday, we announced our uh, our our giveaway for the hashtag Saxtember. Um, and so the giveaway winner for, for this stream for this week is going to be, I have it written down, uh, Robin Meester. So Robin, Robin, uh, get up with me. All right. uh, it's just uh, rich at musicmedic.com. Send me an email, R-I-C-H at musicmedic.com, and we will get you a set of custom key risers. So if you're watching this video now or if you watch it this week, uh, take the hashtag Saxtember, put it in the comments below. We'll enter you into the drawing for next Friday's video. Benny's going to be back next Friday doing uh, playing the Wilmington Tenor, uh, which is going to be coming out next week. Um, so just to reiterate, this bass saxophone uh, is the Wilmington Pro bass saxophone with the Alterec vent, and Benny's going to play it with the stock mouthpiece and reed that actually comes with it. And Benny's going to play something in the key of D for bass sax so that you guys can hear uh, how smooth it goes or how smooth it works. <laughs> perfectly um nice even though i never played the bass before right up until a couple minutes we did a little sound check but <clears throat> yep um um i don't have to adjust anything <clears throat> my armature stays the same um and throughout the horn it it, it speaks all right um, success yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right yeah awesome well benny thank you so much for coming in to play test this kurt thank you so much for their in-depth explanation absolutely uh, guys, this has been our Friday Live where we talk about products in depth here at Music Medic. Uh, stay tuned for this coming Wednesday for our Wednesday Wisdom, where Ryan and I will be back giving a preview for his soldering course. That's going to be on September 16th, and, the, and then the video is the day before Wednesday, um, September 15th. And uh, we're going to let Benny play for a little bit more. 
Um, and then we'll see you guys next time. Uh, make sure you put that hashtag Saxtember into the comments, share and like this video if you could. It really helps out our channel. And um, until next time, we'll have Benny play a little bit. Thank you guys.